اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في ما توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم قنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي بالحق ولا يقضى عليك إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستكفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يدل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد uh, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it um, a beneficial discussion uh, for us and we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate and take away from us this pandemic and then may he continue to protect us all in our wali dhalika wal qadr ali and for those of us who have lost people to the pandemic may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them and uh, uh, not only that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive um, those of us who have had on or who have had people who have crossed over to the Barzakh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our dead. Allahumma ikfil mawtana wa mawta al So, uh, I, guess I want to dive straight into the topic. I've been told to discuss guiding faith in a multi religious society. Multi or multi religious society. How do we protect our faith in? A society that has different competing ideologies, each proselytizing their faith. It's saying that this is what you got to do to uh, attain salvation. This is what you got to do to have eternal life and so on and so forth. Uh, especially given our circumstances as Nigeria, uh, Nigeria is a bit peculiar because uh, even in other multi-religious societies, there is a defined, uh, especially in in, in, in so-called first world or, uh, countries, there is a defined uh, law uh, that is adhered to when it comes to religious issues. It's either they are, they are extremely secular, as you have in France, who are secu- their own brand of secularism is, uh, is better portrayed as being anti-religion. And you have places like, uh, like, like, like the US that is secular, um, but they allow everybody to to say what they want, whatever they want to say. It's a separation between uh, the church and state, as they say. Nigeria is peculiar in, 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 in the sense that um, even if these laws exist, they are not implemented. So you may enter a public bus and you have somebody blaring, using a public address system in a, in a bus and then blaring at you, telling you that Jesus is the only um, way to salvation. Whether you like it or not, you just got you have to listen. Or you may be in your house. I've witnessed a situation whereby we were about to start Salat uh, Sube. Our Imam, a very old man, who be in his 70s or his 80s at that time, as he made the takbirat al Iram Allah Akbar, one of these street preachers came right in front of the, the mosque. The mosque was not yet roofed then. And then he started preaching. The, the old man was so peeved, he was so annoyed that he had to see. He broke the Salah and told him, move away from this place. So you have this. Uh, these peculiar circumstances in Nigeria whereby people do not even obey laws. So, uh, uh, so, but what applies to Nigeria, of course, would apply to other societies that are uh, multi-religious. So, I, I want to start by saying that what this faith we're talking about, why do we need to protect it? What is, why is this topic important? And um, the topic came as, um, I, I won't call it a surprise, because it's, um, Part of what I have been expressing for a while now, I've seen people who are apparently practicing, I've seen somebody who prays, then comes to me and says that, um, Ustad, I am having doubt about my faith. I'm even about to stop praying. I'm about to stop praying. I mean, I've had issues like this. I've had people questioning fundamentals of the faith, saying that why should we, why is jihad a part of Islam? Why is slavery a part of Islam? Why should uh, some people go to hell and stuff like this? And, and unfortunately, at the time that I was, this, this experience is rather unfortunate. At the time that the Boko Haram attacks peaked 
at that time. That was during the reign of good luck, Jonathan. And it was at that time. It was also the, the time that ISIS was was also uh, always on the news, slaughtering people, beheading people. There was a head of a case of somebody who left Islam totally. And then our argument were around these things that why should, why should Muslim be this violent and stuff like that. Even if she had ulterior motives, if even there were other things that pushed her, I mean, she was able to say that, look, the barbaric act of um, ISIS or Boko Haram uh, indicate that this is how normative Islam is. So it's a, a topic that we need to discuss. Coupled with the fact that Young people, I forget what they call them, gener Generation Z or whatsoever, are more questioning of their faith than others. Even some who do not have the boldness to talk to their parents, talk to their peer. I've heard people, I've, I've heard of a case of people who wore the, jil who wore the jilbab and we are functionally atheists. I mean, they, does Allah exist and, and stuff like that? So this is a very important topic that is that we ought to discuss. Uh, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa make it beneficial for us all, and then for those who are going to listen to this uh, in future. Um, I also want to note that uh, I, I wouldn't want to go into very complex uh, details when it comes to some of the because it is an issue that would of course tra traverse um, our, our normal our normal usage of the words. I may not need to bring bring in philosophical terms and things like that. But I want to make it as simple as possible. I don't want to bring in jargons that we need explanations and stuff like that. So when we talk about faith, why do we need to protect our faith? Our faith is assigned to Deen, the very foundation of our religion. And then our religion, Islam, is the very reason of our existence on earth. Apart from the fact that we have animal needs, the, the need to eat, the need to drink, the need to have shelter, to be clothed and stuff like that, to live with people, this, this existential vacuum in our heart if you are not religious. Uh, even those who are called atheists who feel what we call the existential angst that there's a vacuum what, what is my purpose on earth here Islam serves that purpose Allah tells us in unequivocal terms in the Quran Surah al Zariah, there's a verse that a lot of us would have heard it's just important that we bring it up to show ahamiya to the mawdu the importance of us discussing this type of topic Allah says وَمَا خُلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ وَمَا خُلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ our central purpose of existence on earth here is defined clearly in Islam, defined by the Quran. It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if something is the basis of our existence, the very reason why we are on earth here, the very reason why we breathe, we, we breathe then it means that this thing is something very, very important and it ought to be guided jealously. It ought to be guided jealously. Hence, it is important to guide our faith in respect of the society we find ourselves. And to bother this point, we may find people who live morally, they are kind to people, they are, they are generous, they are, they, are, they are charming and so on and so forth. As far as Sharia is concerned, this is of no benefit to the individual unless the individual has faith. Allah says, so I give, uh, so to, to, to bother with just a few verses, Allah says, Surah al -Ghafir. Allah says, Man amila salihan min dhakarin wa au untha. Man amila salihan, whoever does a good deed, whoever does something very good, irrespective of how good that thing is, whether male or female, Allah says, Wahua mu'min. And at that time that this person was doing this thing, he or she was a believer. Allah says, Fa'ula ikayad khuluna al jannah. Those are the ones that will enter al jannah. It means that if one does good deeds and there is no faith, his work is non and void. If in irrespective of how good these deeds are, they are null and void. Allah says that this will make this a condition. If you are not a believer, if you do not have faith, we are doing this good deed, this is null and void. Allah says in Salat al Nahl, other verse of the Quran, verse 97, Allah says, Man amila salihan min aw untha. Whoever does good, whether male or female, fala nuhiyan nau hayatan tayyiba, will make this person live a very, very good life. And we reward them in, in this world, we make them live hayat and tayyiba, a very good life. In the year after, we reward them far beyond what they've done. We reward them far beyond what they've done on earth here. 
I mean, of course, it's obvious. Aljana, you're going to be there eternally. So we work for 40 years, work for 50 years. Some work for 10 years, some work for 5 years. And Allah SWT will give them Aljana eternally. No end. It doesn't end. It goes on like that. In perpetual enjoyment. May Allah SWT make us the servant of this Jannah. And make us be of those who enter paradise with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Last verse, I will cite the Surah Al-Talaq. This is a, it's a recurrent theme in the Quran. Allah says, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ وَيَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا Who has faith in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and also does good deeds. Allah says, يُدْخِلُهُ جَنَّاتٍ تَجَرِي مِنْ تَحْتِيَ الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا We'll make him mental Jannah. We'll bring him to Jannah. تَجَرِي مِنْ تَحْتِيَ الْأَنْهَارِ I'll generate by rivers flow underneath. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا They'll be in Al-Jannah forever and ever, eternally. So these verses show the importance of faith. Allah tells us that our good deeds will not worth anything. If our faith is not correct, if our faith is not preserved, if our faith is not well guided. So it shows that it's important, this is something that uh, every Muslim needs to learn. That you, your faith has to be protected at all times. Uh, it becomes composed on us to work towards the preservation of this religion. And when we talk about religion, when we talk about uh, Islam, three things are involved. We have an that we, which we can basically call the creed or faith. And we have, of course, al-ma'murat wal manhiyat. We have things that are commanded and we have things that are prohibited. Even those things that are commanded are prohibited, which, is, which are our, our good deeds. If, if we stay away from what Allah has prohibited and we do what He has um, commanded, those goals, those, those are good deeds. Even these ones are motivated by our creed. They are motivated by our beliefs. The, the, the Aqidah or the Iman is like the software that powers the human being. Why am I staying away from Zina? Why Zina is... Um, uh, the, the, the body finds Zina palatable. Why do I stay away from alcohol? Why do I stay away from pork? Why do I stay away from bribery? And these things are enjoyable. I mean, at times you may have a situation whereby the bribe you will be offered at a particular, uh, uh, at a particular uh, work or office or, or whatever, maybe times 10 of what you earn per month. Maybe times 100 of what you earn per month. So this, it's enticing. Why do I drop this thing? Why don't I? Because I feel it is haram. Why do I feel it's haram? Because I believe it is haram. Because Allah made it haram. So at the end of the day, our do's and don'ts are also motivated by what? By our faith. And shows the importance of our iman and the importance of protecting it. So that's just a brief um, discussion about what faith, uh, what our faith is and what it entails and why it's important we have a discussion of this nature. What about societies? In our topic, we said a multi-religious society. In Nigeria, we have a lot of um, a lot of religions. We have people who worship uh, Guru Maharaji. We have people who worship Shangu and so on and so forth. We have traditional worshippers who worship the Urishas. And then, of course, we have the two prominent religions, is Christianity and Islam. In environments like this, there, is, there are always, it may not necessarily be physical conflicts. There are always going to be conflicts around you propagating your faith. You worshipping your faith. I mean, of course, Nigeria is known with this. Uh, it's, it's only reduced uh, uh, after a while. We've always been having a religious crisis. Then Boko Haram came around and stuff like this. So it's, it's always a problem that we need to, we need to address. So Nigeria is a, a multi-religious society where these things are very, very prominent. Very, very prominent. So you have people crossing over. Uh, so somebody becomes a, 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 a Christian today, somebody becomes a Muslim tomorrow. These in themselves will generate controversies also. The Kosovars also generate controversy. There was uh, the case of a lady that married the Hausa boy, became Muslim, and it became an issue. And the case of a Christian who became Muslim, and then this all this became an issue. And of course, people will always want to sell their faith. Given that Islam and Christianity are proselytizing faith, they all want to spread their faith. And then, of course, uh, because the Yoruba traditional, traditional religion finds itself in the midst of these people who are propagating their faith, Yoruba traditional, traditional religion also wants to propagate itself and hence they are campaigning also that they want to be represented so much so that they also 
one social whereby if you offer prayers in a public gathering, public national gathering, and then you offer dua as um, a Muslim, you offer prayers as a Christian, they want you also also bring in people who are traditionalists who would offer prayers in the name of Shangu and Obatala and so on and so forth. <laughs> and uh, our politicians, whether Muslim or Christian, at times from what, what we hear of them, we're not even sure where they belong. So I, I, I once gave a lecture at, uh, I think it was in Abeokuta, and um, a young man stood up and said, you want to do a contest for a, cons uh, for, for a councillorship post. And then uh, the political godfather told him that, uh, so you have to swear. And he said, no problem, this is the Quran. And he said, no, don't swear the Quran here. <laughs> it's a bit open. <laughs> so you, you, you find this in, in Nigeria. And um, that's a multi-religious um, society. What about societies that are not multi-religious? Take an environment like Saudi Arabia, whereby the majority of people are Muslims. The overwhelming majority, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Indonesia, and stuff like that. Shouldn't we protect our faith? And this would lead me to a point I wanted to emphasize, and that's what I talked about as a society. We have to protect our faith not only in multi-religious environment, it's all over now. With the internet, and then with um, smartphones, tabs, and stuff like that, the world is now. I mean, in the early, in the uh, late nineties, stroke the early thousands, they're talking about the world becoming a global village, globalization, and stuff like that. With the internet now, it's like we are a global room. Now here I am sitting down here discussing with us. I'm here around the Anakwaja, and then there are people. I mean, at different uh, uh, places in Nigeria, even outside the country, who are following me, and this same way. Our children, our family members are exposed to Shubu Hat. And I'll talk about Shubu Hat in a, in, uh, in, a, in a second. They're exposed to things that are damaging to them spiritually, damaging to their faith, and so on and so forth. I mentioned a lady that I said became uh, a Christian. When I discussed with her, fortunately, in fact, when, it, when, when I was told that we should go and discuss with her, I wanted to go back home and um, take some of my materials that I used. Uh, that, I, that I write and that my notes that for for uh, Muslim Christian debate. So okay, where well, it's not necessary, let me just go to her. When we go to her, I realized where she was getting her information from. I mean, uh, missionaries who are Islamophobic, like people like David Wood, Sam Shamoon, and things like that. Uh, there's, there's another guy who is dead now, Nabi Qureshi, who was formerly Ahmadi. Then became all what she was citing was gotten from these people. And then she, 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 in fact, she was said to be an Amira of a Muslim organization while she was on campus. But she became, she became Christian. We discussed with her, but of course, she, she didn't, um, she did not change back. So we have these things, right? And then questions I get asked by young people, you realize that they are being exposed to a lot of stuff, a lot of things that you probably, in fact, I believe that, see, even a, a, a Nigerian a, a Yoruba person or uh, let me say Yoruba person in his 50s or his 60s or 70s who is a Muslim and um, is exposed to doubt will probably become a Christian or become an idol worshipper. It's a possibility because uh, for, for a lot of religious people they never drop their idol worship. So it's very easy for them to say that okay, want to combine Islam and uh, Oshun worship. But for our young ones a lot of them are actually toying with atheism. That there's no God that last one time does not exist. These are the questions you ask, you find young people ask you. What are they? In fact, I, it's not even a young, person, a young person per se. That this person was asking me that I, I am about to stop praying. I need to be convinced. I said, okay, where should we start? This man told me that they don't, we are not even starting from saying that we want to say Islam is the best. No, we start from does Allah exist? So, with the internet, a lot of these things are coming in. At times, we see people who wear the jilba, we see people who have beards, and internally, they are burning because they have questions that they have not been able to answer. They have questions they just threw away and said, that, well, let's just accept it like that. May Allah SWT establish our faith. So, that point I brought it up that um, whether it's multi religious, whether it is not multi religious, it is important that we safeguard our faith. And what are we safeguarding our faith against? And that will, that will take me to the next point. Next point, what are we safeguarding our faith, our faith against? One single thing, Shubuhat. Literally, we, we, we say Shubuhat means doubts. Doubts that people create in our mind, doubt that comes up our mind. Islam really the truth? 
does God even exist? Will there be resurrection after death and stuff like this? So, this trouble heart are the things that threaten our faith. So, when we are guarding our faith, what, are we, what am I guarding my faith? Like, say, I, I have uh, a lot of money now. I go to the bank, I put it there. Why am I putting my money in the bank? Why don't I just put it under my bed? Because armed robbers will come around. So, when I understand the threats against something I hold precious, I would be able to define where best I am able to safeguard this particular thing. So, what are we protecting our faith from? Shubu hearts. And this Shubu heart, uh, literally, doubt. We can use doubt. So, if so, when I say Shubu heart, is what I mean. Or Shubha. Shubu heart is a plural, Shubha is a singular. So, when I use Shubu heart, because I may be familiar with that, I mean doubt that are created externally or internally. So, it may come externally from non Muslims, and it may come internally also. From non-Muslims, they want you to drop Islam. If, it, if it's coming from non-Muslim, they want you to drop Islam. So, either to Christianity, or to atheism, or to Buddhism, or to Hinduism. Buddhism and Hinduism, those ones are not, they are not really a church. They are not much of a church. Except for probably Muslims living in India, or living in uh, Myanmar, in Burma, or places where Hinduism and Buddhism are very strong. We don't have much of a movement of Muslims to this faith. But, it's Muslim to Christianity, this is prevalent. Muslim to atheism is shocking. I was, uh, to give another example, I will not mention the name of this, uh, of, the, of the people involved. I was, I was shocked, sadly so, when I learned that um, the son of a very, very prominent scholar in the north actually once romanced atheism. So he, he was there said that he, he, he became Muslim, he dropped the atheism, but at a point in his life, he actually became atheist, or was on the verge of becoming ages. Why? Because he felt that the sciences had a better explanation of the world. He was, he was intrigued with the sciences. So sure, and this is the, the son of a prominent, of a prominent, um, of a prominent uh, scholar in the north. So we have external shibu heart, external doubt raised by those. In fact, I was once shocked when I saw a video of a, you know, growing up, we're used to I mean, did that and uh, Abdetif and uh, people do comparative. And I realized that the level of Christian uh, uh, attacks on Islam is, has gone so much sophisticated than the level of Amadida. I mean, now you see work, of course, against a lot of um, Christians of the city in Nigeria, yeah. But they are more sophisticated. I mean, people go into the Quran and dig up these stuffs and create unnecessary doubt. In the, they say there are institutions that, are, that study Islam as a faith and how to propagate faith for, for Islam. There are books, I have about two, two of them at home. Ishmael, my brother, and then the other one, uh, Ishmael, my brother, is a very discursive text. It's not abusive. It teaches Christians how to go about convincing Muslims. And the other one, I've forgotten the name. That one was a bit uh, harsh, was attacking Muslims. They worship the devil and stuff like that. So you have these sophisticated institutions that study Islam and are attacking Islam. And then you find that the level of responses, fortunately we have some brothers in the West who have done a very good job. May Allah SWT reward them abundantly. So you find little responses uh, against them. And some brothers in the, in the Arab world uh, also did develop, in fact I'm going to be using some of the materials that was produced by uh, Sheikh Ahmed Asayid. I don't Sheikh Ahmed Asayid. I don't know if I got his name well. He wrote a book called Sadigat. Sadigat. I, I don't know if I got it very well. I'm going to be using some of the materials that um, he, he wrote. Even in the Arab world, it became an issue. So much so that the Saudis declared atheism as terrorism. The Saudi law, they, were, they saw the trend. And then they said, that, look, if you're an atheist, you are, you are guilty of terrorism. And they became, they started laughing at them. That, How can you equate atheism with terrorism? Because we are finding these problems in Arab lands. So this external shubhat are raised by atheists, Christians, any anti-Muslim uh, anti uh, movement to take Muslims out of Islam and make them far. And then we have the internal ones. These ones are to turn Muslims into heretics. You have people who question the authenticity of a, a, a hadith. You have Muslims who question the authenticity of Sahih Bukhari, who, who, uh, who say that look, the Quran is sufficient. We have Muslims who are modernists who want to reinterpret Islam along liberal lines. Anything that agrees with liberalism, uh, with a free environment in Europe and America, that is Islam. Anything that does not agree, they'll find a way of throwing it away. So when you talk about Islam uh, legislating the cutting of hands of a, of a thief, which is explicitly said that in the Quran, 
asariku wa sariku tufaqtu aid yawma this is categorically stated azania tu wazani fadidu kulla wahida kulla wahidin minhuma so this this the the the, the adultery uh, you should you should um, the the fornicator and fornicators give them a hundred lashes if they've been married you stone them to death so these rules they will look at them and say no this was at an earlier time no it's a it's a rule of the yahud and things like that people who want a version of islam that is tailor made to suit your own your own desires these are internal shibu hearts and it's not we are not countering the external one alone uh, which is the worst of course because make muslims apostate we want to counter the internal ones also so people say that there's no such thing as jihad in fact, one of the shock, in fact, when I read this on the internet, I said nothing would surprise me again. I read a paper, an entire academic paper that somebody wrote, and he was arguing in that paper. In fact, apart from this, I've seen it in this TEDx talks on on YouTube, where the individual was arguing that um, there's nothing in the, in the Quran that prohibits homosexual acts. So there's nothing in the Quran that prohibits this. And, and what about the comb Lut? What about the people of Lut who were destroyed? I said no. Those ones were raping men. If it was consensual, sexual intercourse with people of the same sex, Allah will not destroy them. I mean, these are a thawabit. Those are fundamentals of the faith. Everything is open to question now. So you have versions of Islam, you have American version of Islam, British version of Islam, and currently the, the Prime Minister of France is working towards a French version of Islam. So we won't talk about Shubuhat. These things that threaten our faith, we're going to talk about countering the external ones that want to make us profile and then countering those internal ones that want to make us heretics or also apostates so um let me i mentioned this already that example book haram and violence when at least i know a person that became an i mean a lot of christian missionaries capitalized on this in fact there's this guy that writes on sarah reporters uh, sarah reporters i see them as atheists so when they mock pastors, when they laugh at pastors, I'm not very, I'm not, I, I would rather support a Christian than, than these individuals who are like atheists. That's one of their writers, Imo, Imo David. There's another one, Raymond Ijabla. I once wrote a response, okay, there was a lady, uh, Alima Musawa, I don't know if I got her name correctly. She wrote an article about Islam being a religion of peace, which was also a watered down article. Islam means peace and stuff like that. And then Raymond Ijabla, who was a medical doctor who wrote against her, and then Sarah reporters published this where he was quoting verse of the Quran saying that the Quran was saying that they should kill non Muslims. So I was so annoyed that I wrote a very hot response against him and I sent to Sarah reporters. Sarah reporters did not publish my own, they didn't publish my own uh, response. So, but I sent to Raymond, and Raymond respond, responded, he said that he will not answer me because of. Uh, the manner I responded, well, fine, you were abusive in your right up, but you, you, what you dish out, you cannot take. So, um, uh, we, we Boko Haram was capitalized on the violence that they unleashed on people. It's the same thing for ISIS, and then a lot of people lost their faith because of this. And an example of an internal one: somebody who said that there is no such thing as hijab in the Quran. And I'm giving a real life example of some of the problems that this caused. When this individual went on air to say that there is no such thing as hijab in the Quran, there was a lady who was just using small uh, uh, cape to cover her head. The husband woke up the next morning after he had listened to this individual and said, look, they've said that this thing is a... Uh, this, this is a real life thing. Real life stuff. It actually happened. Man, the husband said, look, you don't need all this all this thing you're putting on your name. They have, they've just explained that it's an, it's, a, it's, an, it's Arab culture. So you do, it became an issue that they had to solve in the family. So this, these problems are there. If somebody is questioning the authenticity of Sahih Bukhari, that this Ummah had had an agreement on, an ijma, an agreement on for more than 1,400 years, and somebody is questioning it and saying that it is not authentic, is that a hadith that are contradictory to the Quran, then we know that we are in, we are in problems with this shubahad. So to protect our faith means that we have to deal with this shubahad. We have to just tackle them head on. So... Uh, Sheikh Ahmed Asayid, in his book Sabirat, mentioned that we need to we need to be systemic also. We need to be systematic also in addressing shubhat. There are three levels to this shubhat, to this doubt that people spread. The first level is that how do we fortify ourselves against this shubhat? So you have to understand this. How do we fortify ourselves? Like you get vaccinated when these viruses are coming, and you, you your your system is already uh, primed to reject them. So this is a first level. Second level, 
when the Shubu heart had already entered the individual, how do we deal with this individual? How do we convince him or her that um, these things that you are taking around, uh, that you feel is, um, is creating doubt in your mind, is false, is bogus, is worthless, if you look at it critically. And then the last level is addressing the source of the Shubu heart in itself. So we have three levels here. First level, that is Kobla Atatobi Shubu heart. Before you are affected with Shubu heart, what do you, what, what, what do you need to do? And then the second level, if the individual is already afflicted with Shubu heart, what does the individual need to do? And what do we need to do to assist this person? And then the third level is actually identifying the source of this Shubu heart and obliterating it, and obliterating it, and knocking it out. Uh, responding to the Shubu heart one by one and showing by force of argument that this uh, Shubu heart are worthless. So this is how we're going to undo it. The force is about how do we... Um, protect people from falling into Shubu heart. So, Sheikh Ahmad alighted some points. Number one, and these points are not verbatim. I, I um, sort of uh, 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 edited them and made them more, uh, some of them, I gave them more depth, some of them I just, just summarized them. So, the first thing is that, the first thing he mentioned is Ta'azizu, Ta'azizu yakin bi usul in Islam. To make people certain in their aqidah, in their faith, that Islam is the truth. For people to attain certainty in their faith, so much certainty that nothing that they was like you are wearing, uh, it's like somebody wearing a waterproof vest or a raincoat. As the rain drops on you, it just goes away. So you are you are you are like wearing a shubu hat proof. So under this also, he now mentions steps to achieve this. The first one, which a lot of parents are lacking. Is a terbiya and Islamiya a sahiha, giving our children sound Islamic education. We are having problems with this. In the past, we find our fathers when Western education came into Nigeria, and then I mean this is not something that is debatable. Western education was used to Christianize a lot of people. People were Muslims before you go to school, you have to change your name, become Christian. I have people that um, they went to school in in a place like Kora City, Lori, where it's supposed to be a Muslim environment. And then if you're a student, you are coming to school, you have to kneel in the, in the front of the statue of Mary. Make the sign of the crucifix before you even are allowed to enter classes. So, this the, the Western education was brought in to Christianize Muslims. So, our fathers, or our forefathers then, saw that, okay, instead of my children to go to these schools and become kufar, rather they should become illiterate. And this is one of the reasons why in a place like the Southwest, where a lot of people are educated, you find out that a lot of people, the, the, the percentage of Muslims who are illiterate is far more than the percentage of Christians because, of course, they are using it to Christianize us. So those fathers said, no, we will not allow our children. I know of somebody who, the father was only pleased with him when he realized that, okay, his Islam was maintained even when he was in school. So, it, it, thanks to people like... Uh, Dr. Ablativ Adegbite, I mean, Allah SWT bless him and, and put him in agenda for his efforts in establishing a Muslim student society on Nigerian campuses. So people could go to school and then they could still maintain their Islam in schools. So it was these people that actually did, did, um, laid down the framework for what a lot of us came to enjoy later on. So these people, we are, we are, I was going to use this. These fathers, even with the fact that they were not as educated as we are. They had this very high love, this zeal of Islam. Look at the books that were available at that time. I mean, the, the highest book you could find available was probably Makno Risala of Inabu Zaid and Kerawani. A lot of our, our forefathers then did not read beyond Fawaki Usaketa. Some of them did not read beyond, beyond the Abdurusul Awaliya. But the little faith they had, they were zealous about it. They said, no, we will not allow our children to become kufar after Allah like, at, at, at certain as Muslims. But if that is the case now, and I, I mentioned this when I talk about Islamic education, I was once walking past a street, very close to my house then. As I was walking past, then I was walking in a school, they were paying, per term in that school then, a Muslim school, they were paying 250,000 naira per, per term. 250,000 naira per term. And I, I, was, I was walking past the streets, and a mother was telling the child, he said, she said, in Yoruba, she said, that like you would you said if your if your ustad says that you go and be 50 naira 50 naira that you go don't listen to me come back home they like money 
and I was I was shocked. People used to mention it, but I felt that this is how much did 15 naira do? Probably buy it will not, it probably would not even buy bread then. So people we it's like a reverse. We spend so much on Western education, on secular education. We want our kids to speak English as if they are from the UK or the United States. And what we spend for Islam is so so little. And even when we want to talk about Islamic education, what we believe in Islamic education is for them to go to Madrasa and then how to read Aribatata, learn how to read the Quran. If you call a kafir and you teach the Quran, you teach the kafir, if you see a bar with something on top of it, call it bar, that's bar, you see something like gym and it has a castle call it gym, the kafir will read the Quran. Reading the Quran is not the same thing, it's not tantamount to saying having an understanding of the deen. So we need to have a holistic re-evaluation of our Islamic education. There's not a situation whereby you take, uh, okay, I, I, I send them to a Muslim school, whereby they give, even some of these Muslim schools, they need to reevaluate themselves. The, the Arabic teacher would only have probably one period in a week, and then they, they would write uh, Arabic, English, French speaking, which is a lie. Which Arabic would they speak there? <laughs> Our kids learn English from primary one to primary six, from just one to, uh, to SS3, and they fail English language. If you look at our timetable, you have huge chunks of time allocated to English and mathematics, and they still fail. What do you allocate for Arabic? No, nothing. What about Islamic studies? No, just go there, Islam has five pillars, uh, praying, uh, try. It doesn't touch the heart of those kids. They just, just listen to it and then. So it's very possible to find somebody who even went to, I've actually heard of this. I've heard of this. This individual finished from Marcus and became Christian. Finished from Marcus. And I'm not saying it, I'm, I'm just giving an example. And then he met somebody who did not go to Marcus. The person, when he reads the Quran, said he's with, uh, with effort. So they were where they were working because he could speak Arabic. He was bamboozling people. Then this man came around and said, "What are you talking about?" And this man, fortunately for him, had stayed with uh, Abletif Fadibu Adibu Williams, the, the, the late comparative man. So it was this person that was able to confront him and say, "What are you talking about?" So because the Islamic knowledge is dry and shallow, it will produce our big Muslims who, with the smallest of doubts and smallest of sugar art, they will knock them off. So I don't want to dwell too much on that. So we, we need to give ourselves and our children sound Islamic education so that they will appreciate the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sign in Arabic means ayah. And ayah, a sign can be physical, it can be what? It can also be the verse of the Quran. So we have those physical signs of Allah looking at the heavens and thinking about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. Even our own bodies, the way our body works, Looking at them and seeing that oh Allah SWT, Allah SWT actually exists and is a being with great power. And we can also contemplate on the verse of the Quran. Allah says about his al ayat al kawniya those physical signs of Allah SWT that we can find around us. Allah says, Alladina yadkurun Allah qiyama wa qu'uda. And of course, at times, certain scholars, the only time they remember this is when they want to collect money from people. You go to occasions and they say, Stand up, let's do at car. This verse is not even talking about Sandra Baghdina Kari. It's talking about the fact that people who are believers are always constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ladina yadkuru Allah kiyama wa kuhuda wa ala junubihim. Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they are standing, sitting, or even they are lying down. The Allah says, wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal out. And they sit down and think about the creations of the heavens and the earth. And they will say, Rabbana, ma khalaqta hadha batila subhanak. And they will say, oh Allah, you did not create these. Bartilan, you do not create this in jest or in falsehood. Glorified are you. Because there's no way you sit down and look at the way Allah SWT has created the heavens and the earth without being afflicted by prior shubha that you will not realize the enormity of the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah says, Sanurihim, Sanurihim ayah, Sanurihim ayah, Tina fil afaq of yang fusihim, Hatta yatabayyan lahum an nawlahak. Sanurihim ayah, Tina, who show them their signs fil afaq. On the earth, in the heavens and the earth, we show them their signs. Wafi and Fusim. And even in their cells, we show them. Until it's clear to them that this is the truth. So I give an example. This happened to me personally. I have a background in chemistry. And in the very first years, we did the uh, cell biology. And our lecturer was talking about meiosis. That is our cell division to create sex cells. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't want to go too deep into that. So as he was explaining what happens in the cell, how 
the chromosomes get attenuated, how they, they, they divide and stuff like that. What will strike your mind? I mean, there's no way. It's what strikes your mind is just that no, this thing did not happen by chance. Somebody must have created this. And then this verse passes to Wafi and Fuse in their cell. Professionals in the field, when they see the way our body works, would realize that this is this has been created by somebody. So we're supposed to sit down and think about these things. But unfortunately, even the thinking about this, even thinking about this, is, is becoming affected by our contemporary world. Uh, I'll give another example. If you look at the night sky in Lagos, you can, the stars are so, are so scanty. The night sky in Lagos. It does not, it's, it's not awe inspiring. It doesn't really take you up to, for you to gaze at the heavens and look at and, and how beautiful it is. But when you go to villages where you don't have a light, when you have this lot, where you have this light all around, and you gaze at the heavens, you are awed. You you you, you see how massive the stars are, how plentiful they are. So, and I think even the Sheikh mentioned that it, that modern life may not allow us to look at us because children now, kids now are busy looking down at their phones. They are not even looking at the heavens. The Allah says, "Wa tafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi." Rather, they are looking at their their, their phones and they, they were created by Apple or by. Uh, by Samson. So also the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are to connect people, the argument that the Quran pushes forward when it comes to the creation of the heavens and the earth, when it comes to resurrection, when it comes Allah addresses, I mean the Quran is filled with addresses of a lot of these tribal art. When we address people who believe that there is no God, we believe that um, uh, who are atheists and, and the Quran as though the Quran presupposes the existence of God that naturally human beings a, a, a program, we call it the fitra, not really a program, the way we are, if an other human being is giving birth to, and this person is not inflicted, with, is not afflicted with um, shubuhat, this person would naturally be guided to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is called fitra. Uh, Allah says, uh, fitratan, fitratan Allahi allati fatran nasa aliha. And then the Muslim Allah said, Ma min mauludin illa wa yula la sutra. Kullu mauludin yula du ala fitra. Everybody that is given birth to is given birth to on this fitra. So I'm a bawahu, but the parents make him for you, you have with Dana, or you know, Sirana, or you know, or the parents make him a Jew, a Christian, or a fire worshiper. Naturally, we are created to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then to worship him. So you find verses of the Quran addressing some of the shubuhat. That if somebody believes that there is no God, you ask him, where did he feel he comes from? And Allah SWT addresses people in Surah to Tur, said, I'm khulikum in ghayri shayin. We did create from nothing. And we know, of course, rationally, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing has no potentiality. It is nothing. You, can't, you, you didn't create yourself. I'm khulikum in ghayri shayin. I'm min ghayri shayin. I'm humul khalikun. Or did they create themselves? This is a rational argument you find in the Quran in itself, but of course this also needs people who would explain this to, to, to individuals. It needs people who are good with tafsir, who would explain, because of course Arabic is not our, our first language, it's not our mother tongue, and we need people who would explicate this for us. So also, when we talk about Tarbiya Islamiya, that will motivate people to think about the creation of the world and then to also uh, do tafakkur of the Quran, we talk about books, Islamic books, Written also in this regard. Some of them very old, like Dara'i Nubuwa of Al Bayaki, Dara'i Nubuwa of um, this other author who is um, Mutazili. Books written to, uh, to, to, to rationally defend Islam and the prophethood of the, of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu wa sallam. So, but oftentimes, we are busy with buying academic books for our kids, uh, they, they read books that are of no um, spiritual benefit to a lot of them. How many of our kids have written books, have read books like uh, The Fundamentals of Tawheed, like uh, of Dr. Bilal Philip? It's in English. I mean, how many of us have even read it as parents ourselves? It's in, you, rather, you find with our children the diary of, the, of a wimpy kid, uh, Famous Five, uh, and Drew, and books like that. But we don't buy books that would actually make them think, appreciate their Islamic heritage. People, how many of uh, our kids who find watching Islamic programs? Not that we they watch terrible Indian uh, soap operas, uh, Mexican ones, and stuff like that. That it, it has no value at all. May Allah uh, continue to um, guide and protect us. So also, how many of our kids are we exposed to dawah? 
How many of our kids were we exposed to that? For some of us, the reason why we became religiously committed is because we listened to a lecture here, a lecture there, and then we appreciated our Islam and decided to be more committed. This experience that we had, our children are not having the same experiences. Some of our children are going to schools that is no, you don't have Muslims students being represented. Some of our children are going to schools that ordinarily they are not even allowed to actually display their Islam. And if we have a child that the only identity of him or her being a Muslim is because my parents are Muslim, then this child would, of course, ultimately lose that Islam. So if I'm Muslim, um, I, I have witnessed it. Why did you become Muslim? Uh, I slept and I and the masquerade was chasing me. And uh, I said in the name of Muhammad, the masquerade did not turn back. And then... Um, I said in the name of Jesus, the masquerade, the masquerade now disappeared, and then I became, I became Christian. You find, I've, I had a friend who became Christian because of this, but rather, it, but for him, rather, he was bringing this up. He said he had a dream, and then he saw that uh, Jesus Christ was the way, and so, but he had, there's a background to him. He, he was having issues with the family, and then the, uh, one of the parents was Christian, and the parent was able to draw him to, 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 uh, to to our side. So you find problems like this where Muslims are nominally Muslims. The only reason they remain Muslims is because their parents were Muslims. Even amongst people who are religiously practicing, even among people who are to art, who are callers, who call people to Islam, in their own homes, they, they, it's like candles who are who is giving lights to people, but its own base is in darkness. So when people say you can read the Quran, no. Reading the Quran does not translate into having an understanding of what the Quran is talking about or what the Sunnah is talking about. So, quality Islamic education, uh, as I mentioned earlier, get them books, expose them to that. So, when we are going to programs, let us take our kids there. Some of the things you feel that they, are, they don't understand, they understand far more than you. I, I, I remember uh, quite about more than 10 years ago, I was teaching some kids and I wanted to teach them the hadith of Nur al Bashir. We are uh, the embryo stays in the womb of the mother. So, because it had something to do with reproduction, I was a bit laid back. So, I paused and I asked them. One, I was teaching two of them. One was nine, one was ten. I said, Okay, do you guys do, have you done reproduction? And said, yes, they've done it in, in school. It's so, okay, tell me what you've learned in school. And I realized that I was being the one who is a prude. They know far better than what I was explaining. So I had no inhibition. At times, what you assume your children do not know, they know far better. So we should expose them to that one. Let them come around. It will, it will stay with them, whatever they learn. And at least they will know that, okay, when I have doubts about my faith, these are the people I, I consult. So also, we should expose them to the stories of those who are Muslims. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed said, so talked about the fact that um, uh, new Muslims. Yes, new Muslims, celebrity mus celebrities who become Muslims, like uh, what's the name of this rapper? Uh, I forgot his name. So it entices people to say, oh, this person has become Muslim. Yeah, but, he, but at the same time, we even have people who, I mean, let them read the story of the Prophet. A lot of our youths have not read the story of the Prophet from beginning to the end. Buy books. These books are in English. I read the Muhammad Rasulullah of um, uh, another week. And it's a very good book. Give them stories of people like Musa bin Umayyah. How he became Muslim and how he was and how, and how he sacrificed so much for Islam. Give them books of this nature. So also, we should make sure that we focus on the acts of our... When we do dawah, we focus on the acts. When our acts are sound, when Islam, when Iman is very sound in our acts, no shubha, no doubt will penetrate it. And an example are the magicians of of of, of Pharaoh of Pharaoh. When Musa dropped his own rod and he swallowed their own rod, and then they became Muslim, Pharaoh was annoyed. And Zaru told you it, it means that Musa taught you magic, and I'm going to kill you, crucify you, and, and things like that. What did they say? They said, do whatever you want to do. In the matakdi hadi la hayat dunya, iqdim anta qadin. Do whatever you want to do. You can only judge this. So because they, they realized that Musa was coming from a very high spiritual level. And then, um, there's also a story in, um, uh, in Sir Bukhari, where Heraclius, the emperor of Rome, had a discussion with Abu Sufyan. And then he asked Abu Sufyan, he said, people will become Muslim. Do they leave Islam angrily? And Abu Sufyan said, no. When they enter into Islam, they don't leave Islam. And Heraclius said that that is how Iman works. When Iman has mixed with the art of people, 
people will never never leave the faith so if our iman is strong in our heart uh, we'll never find it easy to drop to drop off may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a firm understanding of um, of the deen so also we need to empower muslims to think critically critical uh, thinking skills al aklu and naked that is the arabic word so much so that we don't accept any claim except it has evidence so uh, there was a video of a man that went viral one mario joseph or whatever his name is and he was using argument like he said uh, because those guys was mentioned more times in the quran than muhammad uh, and your know, argument of that nature and i had the muslim was worried who sent me the video and said please is there a response to this unfortunately a brother responded to it a very silly argument so that Jesus Christ was mentioned more in the Quran than uh, than Muhammad. It means that Jesus Christ is more more uh, has is more recognition than Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so when the response of Rabbi about Musa. Musa is more mentioned than Jesus Christ. More mentioned that than than, than than Muhammad. Should we all become Jews? And the argument fell apart. So um, uh, may Allah say so. So we need to Muslims need to imbibe critical thinking. So that these um, things that are weak in Shiba Hat will not uh, be a problem for us. So also, when we have critical thinking, we will not take evidences that are worthless. Worthless evidences. This also, apart from Christianity, it also applies in our daily in our daily lives. Somebody has a problem and it says that okay, I've gone to the I I I, I my 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 problems will not have a solution. Let me go to a church, or let me go to a babalao. Ordinarily, if one sat down and thought, you don't even need evidence. If the pastor in that church found things easy, he will not be seen in that church listening to you, waiting for you to bring your problem. It is because of poverty that is why he had the church and he's telling people to come with their problem. He collects money from you. You don't even need evidence for that. You don't need to need. You don't. And you find a lot of these Muslims in white garment churches, Elijah uh, Sallam, stuff like this. What is it, what brought you here? I had a problem. The pastor also had a problem. So if people had critical thinking, they'll be able to realize this. You see Muslims, they buy cars and then they put, uh, some of them put tortoises, they like tortoises in their car so that the car will not have accident. Some Muslims would uh, do what they call people that will protect them from death. It's irrational. If, we, if, if you imbibe critical thinking in people, some of these people do not even have any impact on them. Because how can you say you want to protect yourself from death when the best of mankind died? Have you seen somebody who lived forever? These are the things that take me away. I don't have, I'm having problems. I'm having financial issues. I'm looking for a child. The pastor, if, I don't want to die. Go to the mortuary. You find both Muslims and Christians there. That kills everybody. It doesn't make a distinction. May Allah assist us. So also, um, when they bring illogical things, it will be easy for us with critical thinking to nullify them. I once listened to an atheist in a debate, Peter Atkins. Peter Atkins is a distinguished chemist. And then you, you realize that we, when you lose faith, you lose intelligence. He was saying that when the when he was confronted that look, we exist, and then you must explain where our existence came from. Peter Jackson said that in the universe we have positive energy and we have negative energy. So he said the negative energy and the positive energy, if you add them together, if you mix them together, you have zero. So, so it means that we are not existing. What about stupidity is that? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. The fact that we have positive energy and, and, and negative energy doesn't mean that I'm not existing. Doesn't mean that I'm not, uh, I find myself, I mean, he's, with this stupid argument, he's even denying his own existence. And you find stupid argument like this on, on, on the internet. And people, some people consume this thing and it becomes a problem for them. May Allah assist us. So also, and, and that is why Muslims have two disciplines. One, ilm al-musal al-hadith. The Muslims independently develop this field so that any information you are bringing to them will be carefully sifted. It will be sieved. And they will, so, Ilm al Hadith is about knowing those who are liars, who is actually saying what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu has not said. And if you apply this, especially in Nigeria, it will not only save our religious life, but even it will save us from committing a lot of problems. In Nigeria, you hear that uh, they burn somebody alive in Oshodi, an old woman, and say, so "What? What did the old woman do?" So uh, she was she was a bed, and then uh, she eats a an electric cable, and then turns you. This happened in Oshodi. I heard, and, and it happened also somewhere around them. And the they burn the person to death, and go because the, the, the bed changed to human. And when you start asking them, as far as the, 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 the principles of hadith, were you did you witness?
witness it? Say no, somebody told me. We, did you witness it? No, somebody told me. So in the, as far as hadith is concerned, if you are not an eyewitness, you, you cannot tell us those people who told you. Then the hadith is weak. So say, when did the people? Some say he became a black bed, a white bed, and then if you have contradictory narrations of a particular event, it means the hadith is weak. So in Lagos, they, start, they shout "tif tif tif" on somebody. Somebody who was not there. He, he can bring out his own his own spare tire in his car and, 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 and give it to them for, to roast to roast um, that person. I witnessed one in a position when uh, kidnapping was rife in Lagos State. They beat a man naked into the police station, and then he said he was a kidnapper. And then the policeman said, "Where did he begin? Where is the child he wants to kidnap?" They couldn't provide it. And the police, of course, they just closed the door. Everybody that beat the man inside, they arrested them. So, Myanmar says, so these are the, we, we need to have this critical thinking fuse. So, we will not accept any claim except with evidence. We will not accept bogus evidences. And we have the other discipline, uh, uh, so that we will, we will be able to criticize people. Uh, when people bring false um, uh, uh, arguments like during the apostasy issue of a, of a person in uh, Kanu and I got invited to, a, to an online platform and then when I got there I said why is it why should uh, apostasy, the, the death penalty for apostasy uh, is barbaric is wrong and I, and I asked them and one of the things I told them was number one if you are going to appeal to emotions we, we will not be able to move ahead because you cannot win emotional argument but let us charge these things logically. Why is death penalty for apostasy wrong? And I cited the rises of the Bible that backed up the claim that apostasy should also be killed. And you see that the argument would, would collapse. Ask them why. Ask them why. When someone says a rule is barbaric, so why is it barbaric? What, what, is, what determines what is right and what is wrong? Is it your emotion? Is it your subjective feeling? You realize that a lot of people and not um, do not critically think before they criticize Islam. So also, Sheikh mentioned that one should be grounded as far as Islamic sciences are concerned. And um, even if you are not Islamically uh, grounded, then you should know people to ask. Some people are like motivational speakers, Islamic motivational speakers. You don't go and ask them issues that has to do with um, uh, highly sensitive issues of Akida or highly sensitive issues of. I mean, somebody who just wants to motivate you, wants to make you laugh or stuff like that, and then you have a critical issue to ask and you ask this person, chances are he will not know. And his response at times will be worse than even the problem you are, uh, you, you, you are, you are coming with. So one should be able to recognize, if you are not guarding uh, yourself, one should be able to recognize those who are qualified to, make, to respond to uh, this uh, uh, shubuhat. So also, we need to understand that the person who is bringing Shubhat, where are they coming from? Uh, take for instance, uh, if I was discussing with somebody who's an atheist, and this atheist is saying that, um, uh, convinced me that Allah SWT exists. An atheist does not believe there is anything beyond the supernatural. For the atheist, everything must be uh, within what is um, uh, uh, what, what we call physicalism? Everything is physical. It do, they do not allow for something to exist metaphysically. So if you are arguing with them, and then some of them would, would not even accept rational evidences from you. So if you, it's like you are pouring water into a, into a basket. You need to understand where is where this individual is coming from. Or if you are arguing with somebody who who believes that um, uh, human beings should be the center of the morality, that nothing should be. Uh, Good or, or 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 bad, except what the individual freely freely feels he or she ought to. Do. So if you are arguing with this person, uh, sensitive issues like um, issues of apostasy, issues of uh, your dude, you will not find you will not make headway because this individual does not believe in the in the in in, in the same um, principles that you you believe in. So it's advice that um, we we'll understand that. Um, uh, if I was discussing somebody, we need to we need to have an agreement. What are the masal talaqi wal ma'rifa? Uh, in, in philosophy it is called epistemology how do we come to know things how do we come to uh, know that some things are existing and so on and, and so forth so and then you find people uh, this I heard from a preacher in the US 
a, a, a young man was having problems in his, with his faith. And then what was the problem? The person was saying that uh, the Quran preaches that the earth is flat. And we know from geology, from geography, and uh, cause, and um, astronomy that the earth is round. And he said, look, these are, these are some of the problems that people have. The, the, this is not, I mean, Ibn Hazmi, uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, said that um, as far as um, Islam is concerned, we never had this belief that the earth is flat. Rather, we've had this belief that the earth is round. So at times, people would be having problems with stuff that they're not supposed to have problems with initially. So we have this universal law or the modified universal law of Ibn Taymiyyah. What is categorically known of the intellect? What is known? I'm not talking about scientific hypothesis. I'm talking about something that is a fact, a physical fact. Cannot clash with something, with, cannot clash with a verse of the Quran or a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that is authentic and categorical. You cannot have what is Qati'u Thubut or Qati'u Dalala of the text, a, a text that is categorical. Categorical in its meaning, categorical in its authenticity, clash with an established scientific fact. It's another thing, it's not a scientific fact, up in issue. Like the theory of evolution. Adam was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not have parents. This is categorical. It is kati'i, thubut kati'i dilala. You find this in the Quran. If somebody says that um, Adam came through a process of evolution, we will reject that, that hypothesis. We will reject the theory that, look, this is not this incorrect as far as we are concerned. So I was talking about um, uh, the modified universal law that you, you cannot, it's impossible, you cannot find a scientific fact. I'm not talking about scientific theory. A scientific fact that clashes with a categorical verse of the Quran or the Hadith. And I will give an example. Um, before the Big Bang theory of the existence of the beginning of the universe, there was a theory called the steady state theory that the universe had no beginning and had no end. Uh, but on Russell said, the universe is all there is and all there will be and all there will be. So, and that's why we tell even brothers who go around with science in the Holy Quran that look, do not tie scientific theories that are subject to change to verses of the Quran that are called categorical. Because the scientific theory may change tomorrow. And this is the nature of the sciences. There was a time that um, when you ask them what was um, responsible for combustion, they would take a phlogiston or, or phlogiston or something like that before it became uh, oxygen. So we don't tie scientific theories that are not facts to verses of the Quran. So if somebody had said that, okay, the, the universe had no beginning, okay, let's, let's find a way of forcing the Quran to, to, to talk about that. Or like some are trying to do now, forcing the Quran to speak about evolution, like um, one of these authors, um, Maurice Bukir, did in a book that uh, I think Human Origins or so, he was forcing the verse of the Quran, like uh, that um, the Quran was talking about evolution. This is false. The, the evolution can be changed tomorrow. In fact, we, have, we, are, we are having people who are challenging the theory of evolution within the scientific establishment itself. They are not saying that it should be changed totally, but they are saying that it should be modified. So we do not, they, when, when people come around and they, say they have a problem with Islam because it is, they find this particular scientific theory not accommodating, uh, they find Islam not accommodating a particular theory, is the theory you question, not Islam. Because science is always in a state of flux, it's always changing. A theory today, we just in tomorrow. Till today, even with the fact that we know that gravity works, there is no established theory of the, of, of um, the, 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 the the force of gravity. Is is gravity because of an is, is gravity does gravity occur because uh, there's an indent in space time? Because planets and stars are massive bodies that cause a dent in space time and would drag like smaller bodies to themselves. Is it why there's gravity, or is there a force of gravity that we can a, a, a quantum theory of gravity? These are things that are not determined by the sciences themselves. So one does not go ahead and now start forcing the neck of the verse of the Quran to agree with theories that can change tomorrow. May Allah well give us a, a firm understanding of the, of the thing. Number five, we do not expose ourselves to shibuhat. Some people have this problem. I mean, if you are not grounded, if you do not have that researching skill to answer questions that come your way, why would you go to Christian websites that are attacking Islam? To, what do you want to go and do there? Or some people go to atheist websites website and consume this material that are spiritually damaging, and they don't have an answer for it. Then they come around and ask you that, uh, so as I read something, that uh, uh, the, the society prophet did this, prophet did that, and so on and so forth. 
Why should you go? Why, I mean, you find in the books of the past predecessors, the self, where they will tell you that don't listen to a heretic. Because if you listen to the, a, a, a particular expression of um, one of them, uh, no, the Abi, he said, Al Kulubu Da'ifa wa Shubuhat Khattafa. He said, Our arts are weak, and Shubuhat, doubts are very, very fast to get our arts. So why should you go ahead and listen to people that you know that are planting uh, Shubuhat all around? Some will just read a few books, read a, book, a few books of Ahmadiyya, and then they believe, they believe that they have become uh, uh, comparators. Muslim apologists. Even oftentimes, you realize that some of these Muslim apologists do not know sufficiently about the Quran. They know the Bible more than the Quran. And that's why one of them had a problem now. He believes that Isa is not coming back. Because the Christians in debate, you are always facing him with the fact that the Quran says Isa is coming back. So to, to put this away from himself, he, he denied that Isa is coming back. They believe that has been held by this Ummah more than 1,400 years ago. There is no difference of opinion among the companions, among the Tabi, only among those who follow them, that Isa is coming back. This is what happens when people carry up. Big. You know the Bible, stick to it. When it comes to Islamic knowledge, ask people who are qualified. Some people expose themselves to Shubhahat, and at the end of the day, they lose out. Some people go to atheist website. As I said, the world is a global village. They go to atheist website, and then these atheists would bring stupid arguments. So I'll give you another example. The atheist would ask you, if you are not good enough, you say that, he would tell that, okay, you guys believe that um, everything that exists has a creator. You listen to the argument. Everything that exists as a creator. If you are not, if you are not critically, if you are not sound, you agree with that premise. Immediately you agree with that premise, he has knocked you out. So it's when it tells you that okay, you guys are say that everything that exists as a creator. And say yes, you say does Allah exist? What would you say? Yes, then who created Allah? Because you agree with that premise, you are not supposed to agree with the premise initially. This is not our argument. We do not say everything that exists as a creator. No, that's not the argument. We say everything that has a beginning, everything that is imagined has a creator. Kulu hadith lahu muhadith. Everything that is imagined as a creator has uh, everything that's, uh, that has a beginning as a creator. And this, some of the argument you can infer from that verse I mentioned. Nothing cannot create something. Something must have created that thing. Allah SWT has no creator. And some, someone might say, okay, what? Why should every other thing have a creator and Allah does not have a creator? This also has been addressed by scholars centuries ago. So they say, look, if you have this, this analogy that actually comes to me, a football analogy. Let's say we have a player who wants to take a, a, a penalty shot. And this individual, this player, before he takes, okay, let's say C. Ronaldo, very popular amongst young people. C. Ronaldo wants to take a penalty shot. But before he takes the shot, he has to, the, the umpire, the referee has to blow the whistle. And then it's only when the umpire blows the whistle that he takes the shot. But there's a snag. This umpire, this referee cannot blow the whistle until another referee blows the whistle. And then this also, this referee also cannot blow the whistle until another referee blows up like that, like that, till infinity. Endlessly, we must have a referee to blow the whistle before the referee would say that the player should take the shot. Would that penalty shot be taken? No. Because the person that will, blow the, 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 that will blow the whistle is infinite. It has no end. The whistle will not be blown. Will not be blown. Immediately the player kicks the ball, it means that there is a limit to the number of referees. So the same thing, uh, creation has a creator. And if you are saying that this, the creator also must have another creator, the creator must up to infinity, there will not be creation. So there is a limit to what... Um, to uh, we we'll call it a uh, causal finitism. I don't want to bog us with the details. This is Shubha, a lecturer teaches um, people philosophy, called philosophy 101, in OAE, if I'm not mistaken. So he comes to class and he asks the people, Muslims and Christians, he asks them, Can God create a stone he cannot carry? He throws this. This is Shubha. This is a doubt. He says, Can God create a stone he cannot carry? Then you start wondering, because there's no answer you would give that would not. Will not put you in problem. You say yes, he can. It means okay, God cannot create, cannot carry a stone. If you say no, it means that our God cannot create everything. But questions of this nature, our scholars have handled them in way, way, way back. And the response to this is that, that that question in itself is wrong. That question is wrong because you cannot have a stone that Allah SWT will create and then you will not be able to what be able to carry it. He can create anything and he can carry anything. And then, when you look at the, the, the way this question, this question has been structured, you realize that yes, it has been deliberately set up so as to what? 
so as to make you in, unable to answer. So we say that this question itself is where the problem is. Logic allows one to tell has the power to create everything. However, logical impossibilities are not a thing, are not things. Things that are logical in, in, uh, uh, that are logically incoherent are not things. So I give an example to make it clear to us. If I were to ask you, can you draw a circle? All of us would say, yes, of course. I just take a pencil and then draw a circle. And that's it. So I ask you again, can you draw a triangle? Of course you can. I mean, just draw a, a figure with three sides and you're done. But if I were to ask you, can you draw a circle with three sides? It will be impossible. But is this because of your inability to draw or because of the fact that a three-sided circle does not exist? It is because a three-sided circle does not exist, not because you cannot draw it. So the same thing, a stone that Allah can create and cannot carry does not exist. It is an impossibility. So Ibn Taymiyyah was saying that Allah has power over, and that's what the Quran says, Allah has power over everything. But logical impossibilities are not things. Jumping off words together does not mean that those words would exist. So people bring this shuba. If one is not um, sound enough, who you, uh, you expose yourself to things that will create doubts in your mind. So also, we can read books that scholars have written to refute this Shubha heart in as much as these books are well written, are well, are well written and address this Shubha heart uh, add on. And if, for books of this nature, we will not delve into this Shubha heart, this doubt, we will not delve, delve into them in detail. Rather, we will just bring them up and address them in detail. So to go into detail of explaining Shubha heart will also put people into a lot of problems. So, may Allah SWT give us a firm understanding of, of, uh, of the thing. So, what I've been able to uh, talk about are protections for ourselves before Shubuhat come. So, um, and the last one on this is that um, apart from teaching our kids Islamic knowledge, we should also make not only our children, ourselves, uh, we should allow ourselves to practice Islam in societies. Islam is a religion that is not done in isolation. It must be uh, in a group of Muslims. Allah says, Ya ya ladina amanu taqul maha wa kunu maa sadiqin. Oh, you are faith. Believe in Allah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and be with those who are truthful. Be with Muslims. Practicing Islam in isolation is a problem. Whenever our children leave a peer group of people who are Muslims and they relate with people who are non-Muslims, the influence is very great. Somebody will not go astray unless he or she has lost his or her roots. So we should, I mean, it's not necessarily we thought this, uh, this should be your friend. No, by association, the places we go to, the people we interact with, would put our children in a sort of environment whereby they are in safe hands. Whereby even when she wants to enter into them, they can say that, okay, let us address this thing head on together. So it is essential that we practice Islam as a community, not as, not as individuals. May Allah like, give us a firm understanding of, of, um, of the deen. Uh, and of course, there are two most, especially the segment that talks about what to do after we have been exposed to Shubhat. Uh, if the question and answer, if it comes up, I would, uh, I would um, mention this. But basically, it's also, it's patterned along what I've said, critical thinking. We don't just take what people say. We ask the specialists, I mentioned it also in the earlier one. So also, we go through the books. A lot of the Shubhat people bring around now had been answered several, I mean, Islam was the dominant, the, just like you have the West dominating us now, Islam was the dominant civilization for a long time, hundreds of years, all the philosophies of the East and the West came into the Islamic world, in fact, some of these philosophies were translated into Arabic and then it got, got back to the West, all these things have been answered, there is no doubt people have about Islam that has not been answered, I mean, the, 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 the Quran was read in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu It was explained by people. It's not a book that was written in hundreds of years after the Prophet Sallallahu came. Everything has, has an answer. So also, when people want to selectively quote the Quran and the Sunnah, we always tell them that, no, you have to take the Quran and Sunnah together in unison. You cannot cherry pick verses of the Quran, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and turn it to a shuba. And on this, I would, I would end and take questions about any. So yeah. Christians who will say that uh, the Quran also talks about multiple gods. 
that uh, you, you, if you are saying that Allah is one, what, what about the Quran? The Quran says, Inna nahnu al Quran wa inna lahu la We revealed the Quran and we are going to uh, are going to protect it. So look at the 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 the, 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 the pronouns there. They are they are plural uh, uh, pronouns. So you tell this individual that no, you have not understood the Quran. You have not understood the Quran. The Quran is using the plural of majesty for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are issues that some Christians use against Muslims that the Muslims cannot answer. So you tell them, look, this verse you have cited, you have not gotten it. Read the verses that are clearer. We are says, Kul Allahu Ahad, Allah Summit. Say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Allah Summit is the eternally besought of all and stuff like that. So when people want to change, pick verse of the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet, you take them back to the categorical verses of uh, the Quran and categorical, categorical hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, and then you remove the uh, the problem and the shubhat. Uh, yeah. Still have a lot of things to say, but um, I will pause here and take questions if there are any. I hope and the little I've been able to see uh, will be sufficient to protect us from shubhat that threatens our faith in especially in environments that um, this shubhat are, are prevalent uh, and yeah, basically everywhere. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala preserve our faith. Is that the fate of our children in the world? Now, in this circumstance, they should not slaughter this end because, uh, in traditional settings of this nature, when you talk about um, slaughtering uh, animals, there, there's something fetish behind it. Then, uh, it is also not advisable to patronize uh, these traditional healers. I don't know if there's a medical doctor in the house. They used to condemn this because some of some of the fractures people sustain may not just be a bone fracture. It may affect soft tissue, which they are not trained to handle. And so it becomes complicated. And then I've, I've, I've had a friend who lost his life. He had, he had a car accident and they assumed it was a fracture, not knowing that it has affected his internal organs. So let's go to those who are specialists to attend to 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 to, um, to our fractures. So as to the slaughtering of the end for anything to make the bone ill, we should not uh, participate in the slaughtering. Allah Allah. The, the, yeah, the, 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 the janib does not. It doesn't. There, there's no. Um, how do I put it? It's not something that gives people knowledge. It's them um, going out to do dawa, and then a lot of times people. Who, these people who go on this outing themselves are, um, sorry to say, ignorant of even some of the basics of the thing. They memorize about six points. The, everything comes from Allah and stuff like that. And then they say people should go out and then go and preach this. One is knowledge. One is to sit down. If, if I'm a parent and my child wants to go for a job, I will not allow him. That's that was the blunt, the blunt truth. For what do they want to achieve with the jadi? Just go out and preach. And then the circumstances that are at times very, very um, unhealthy for a child, if it's a young, a, a young child. What, we want people to learn, not to go on the jadi and then not acquire anything when they come back after four months. And by, by, by virtue of them going out, they become one big sheikh. Then when you ask them basic ruling of the thing, they don't know. So jadi is not a, a school. It's not a place of learning. It's just... Um, uh, sort of religious adventure. Let the child learn in a madrasa uh, where, where the child will actually be acquiring knowledge. And, and at times, these people would would, would um, be denigrating some knowledge. You said that, but uh, Shaitan became arrogant because of knowledge. I mean, this is totally, ad, and that's why, it, because it's based on ignorance, it's at, it at, it's at variance with what Islam preaches. Islam preaches, Islam cherishes the acquisition of knowledge. The, 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 the fact that it's compulsory on us to know what we are doing, the jadi does not make us acquire it. So, no, church should not go on the jadi. Church should go to a, a madrasa where they teach them uh, uh, um, aspect of the thing. And then we, we buy books for them, buy Islamic books for them, let them have a culture of reading, and buy these books for them, take them to lectures. In fact, going to a lecture where they are going to teach topical issues that are important to that child's life, one lecture of such that this lecture will have an impact on that child's spiritual life. It's better than 40 days jadi. And I'm not exaggerating. Because there you have khrafat, uh, myths and things being spread around. So, I, I, I don't agree with people going on uh, on jadi. Lord. Yeah, uh, so on, on, on uh, cryptocurrency and, and stuff, this is a new thing. Uh, it's, it's relatively new. Um, people wanted uh, currency that would not be 
uh, controlled by state players. So, and then uh, this Japanese guy, or whatever his name is, uh, Sakamoto or whatever, drew up a paper and they worked on it. So, Bitcoin and its attendant technology, blockchain um, technology, um, became something that scholars differ on. So, we have some scholars who say it is haram, and then they have reasons for calling it haram. Uh, some said because it can be used for money laundering, it's not legal tender and stuff like that. And we have scholars also who say it's halal. That you don't, when it comes to legal tender, it's what, we, what the community actually agrees on that um, that becomes money. So if we agree that this um, bottle sh should become legal tender amongst us, then it becomes money. This is the view of Imam Malik. And then they, they said, okay, if you're saying that Bitcoin can be used for, for, for your, uh, money laundering, dollars also is used for money laundering. Does that make the dollar haram? Um, some said that uh, it has no backing, that Bitcoin has no backing. It's just peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer, uh, you know, but the paper money also has no backing. Uh, people seem to believe that our paper money is still backed up with the gold silver standard. No, that was ages ago. After Bretton Woods, our paper money is fiat money. So anyway, scholars are divided into two. Those who say it is haram, those who say it is haram. However, the same position is to say that the rule should be dependent on the community one is in. So if the government of the day accepts Bitcoin as legal tender, then it should become legal tender. And for a long time, I was telling people that it was, as far as I'm concerned, it was halal. Because the Security Exchange Commission had a, an announcement, which I read, that they deemed Bitcoin to be security. And if something is security, you can trade in securities. I mean, securities, I mean, the, 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 the line between securities and, um, and, uh, and um, currency is free. The message of Allah, the gold that was used for as currency was also used to batter. So, based on this, I will tell people that, look, it's, as far as I'm concerned, because of what the Security Exchange Commission has said, is halal. But some days ago, probably a day or two ago, the Central Bank came out with another pronouncement that banks should not deal with it, and like a ban, really. So, that has um, sort of um, complicated things, and, I, and my advice is to uh, to people is that look with the, with the CBN coming out with this pronouncement now we should just hands off and then wait till uh, we have a clear picture of what the government is saying but in communities like as I've, as I've heard like, like in Germany and some other places this thing has become legal tender that people exchange the way they exchange money even if there are some regulations in such communities that it has become legal tender then it is halal in such communities but in our own that we are still a bit confused let us wait and uh, and see what the government position is going to be before we take decision. And that is my personal view on it. Allah Allah. Tawheed al-Aqid al is not restricted to Asma Wasifat alone. Though it's a, a, it takes a central sp uh, a space in the book. But it's not, really t it's not, it's not um, uh, that alone. It even covers beyond Allah Subhanahu It talks about other things like... Uh, the, the hisab and stuff like that. So, but if you want a more comprehensive book, read the Shadow of um, Al Aqidah Al Tahawiyah by Ibn Abi Iz Al Hanafi. Shadow Al Aqidah Al Tahawiyah by Ibn Abi Iz Al Hanafi. So he, he talked about some of these issues, even about Rubia in his issues. Because for a lot of Muslim scholars and also the Quran, atheism is not something that was prominent. The Quran presupposes, I mean, the people. That, the message of Allah was, was discussing with where people who believe that Allah existed, but rather they believe that the lesser gods, uh, Hubal, Al Uzza, and stuff like that, also deserve to be worshipped. So that by worshipping them, they can go close to. I mean, very similar to Yoruba belief. Yoruba believes that there's Uludumari, who is the central deity who created everything. But they believe that he created the Orishas. And they, they believe that, I read in a book of uh, Professor Wanda Amibola that Yorubans do not give sacrifices to Olodumari. And also, you see, in, in a society, they don't, they don't put a sacrifice somewhere and say that this sacrifice is meant for Olodumari. No. They believe it's up there, but they need to placate the Orishas to, to get um, earthly favors. Just like this was very similar to the Macans, the way the Macans did their stuff. So, um, there is no emphasis much on um, Rububia in, 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 in quite um, some of our Akeda books. But yes, at the same time, they covered it. Uh, at Tahawiya covers this uh, um, sufficiently. And um, uh, um, books of Sheikh Salim Temiya, though this may be advanced books of Ibn Temiya, where he addressed um, some of these objections. I think um, uh, in As-Safadiyya, these are very, very technical works. 
I think also in uh, I read one recently. We were talking about the, 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 that the world was created. He was refuting people who, who, who held that the world was eternal. So anyway, he, he will bring some of this argument that has to do with the Rubia in it. For Tohin and Ibada, the best book you can have is Kitabu Tohin of Muhammad Ibn Abu Bakr. This also is not to is Tawhid Ibada takes the largest chunk of the book, but there are also aspect, other aspects of Tawhid also. And then one of the easiest Sharh is the Sharh of uh, Ibn Uthaymi. So if you if you um, get these books, you find um, you find what would what what is uh, sufficient. Inshallah.